morning, friends, and welcome to worship on this chilly day. I know, it's, it's what, November 13th? It's supposed to be like this, and yet, <laughs> I'm not ready. Uh, whether you are in-house or joining us from home, we are glad that you are with us. I want to say a particular hello to our friends at Hallmark, who are Larry Purvis and crew, who are watching, or, or are trying to watch. Hopefully everything is working well. Thanks to Shane Osterman for being our liturgist this morning, and rumor has it that there are treats afterwards provided by the Williams family, so thank you guys. Stick around. You don't want to go outside yet anyway. So head on downstairs, and, um, and actually before you do that, this morning we are, um, and maybe we can do it over treats downstairs as well, but we, we are... Um, going to have a, a Q&A for anybody who has questions, concerns about the AV project, the audiovisual update that we are doing around here. Let me, um, Scott Larson and I and Shane and I don't know, maybe Gerald will stay too and, and Larry will stay and if you've got questions about it, talk to us. Um, just here's an update, the electrical uh, work is underway and um, the, there are cameras, they are not functioning. And I just want to say a word about what I call the Pew View camera. I know why we did the Pew View camera. It's because um, there are folks who just aren't going to make it to worship probably anymore, potentially, including folks at Hallmark, and wanting them to be able to see faces during times like passing of the peace. So when I look at that camera, I think of Larry Purvis. Um, but it is also, I want to acknowledge, disconcerting to have a, have a camera. But that will not be used uh, a lot. And, and only during what I call the public times of the service, like when we're passing the peace and when the children are coming down and maybe sharing of joys and concerns. But, but if you have concerns about that, please feel free to talk to me about it. I know, it's, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, or it's changed, and it's, yeah. And this is, after all, a sanctuary, right? And we're supposed to be able to come here and be kind of separated from those things in the world. Um, Scott Larson's going to be building a new desk up there for the equipment, and probably, I don't know, this might be the most controversial, but we are going to have a flat panel TV there and here and on the balcony, and we will be using that judiciously, which if you have questions about that and concerns about that, come and talk to me. Um, I'm, yeah, yeah, I, I know it's, and uh, there's, there, it's a longer conversation than we have for in the announcements, but please, 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 talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Um, but Shane, will you talk a little bit about, <coughs> one, of, one of the things that changed my mind is a conversation I had with Shane and the Osterman family, so you want to tell us about your experience? Yeah, I think that conversation is probably four or five years ago now. Yeah, so a we, months after you guys started coming. Yeah, so one of the things I think that happens in a lot of churches is the ability to come in and actually just exhale when you come to church. And when we first came here the first time, we walked up the rainbow steps and we felt like, man, we were coming here because we felt like we were coming from a church that wasn't welcoming, wasn't inviting, wasn't didn't represent who we were. And so when we came in, I'll never forget the first time, and I have very irregularly gone to what I would consider a traditional service. Almost all the services I've been to have been quite contemporary. And while I fell in love with the community and everything, like I will never forget the first time being like, okay, do I stand up? Do I sit down? Do I, like, where am I at in this? And it made it so, I think even maybe f more for our kids, it was like, what's going on? And so one of the first things I was like is like, where's the coffee house? And we don't have one of those, which is fine, but it's surprising when you go to many larger churches how they make it a little bit more consumer oriented, which is not necessarily a good thing, but what it does do is it does make it so it's inviting to people. And so I experienced that quite a bit, and of course we're still here yeah. four or five years later, whatever it is. But the other thing that I think has happened through the pandemic is I know that, and with our kids getting older, there's just certain times we can't make it. And having a better produced environment to rewatch it, I think, keeps people engaged. 
and for those people at Hallmark or like I think of Becky and Al right now not being able to be here and just making it, wanting to make it as inviting and as engaging as possible. I think that's really important too. And at the end of the day, the reality is the church is supposed to be a welcoming place for those people who are unchurched too. And sometimes that means just coming in, sitting down, and being able to follow along without feeling like you're missing a beat. And I think by having the screens up, that will significantly help us and help people feel that ability when we take that deep breath to be like, okay, I don't have to grab my bulletin and, <laughs> and, then, and the right? hymnal and then know where I'm, what's going on. So I'm excited to see it. Um, I hope that it will help people feel just welcome. I think for young families, particularly sometimes when we have people with two or three kids and this is the first time here and they're worried about them being too loud and they're worrying about all that, it's just one less worry to know that there's something that they can follow along with. So I'm, I'm excited for that. And we have, uh, I think, made some great strides with the youth program. I've seen whether it's middle schoolers come for the first time or I've seen younger kids come for the first time, that having that environment's going to be... Yeah. I'm excited to see it because yeah. I think it'll just yeah. continue to help us um, connect with families. Yes, I hope that, that's our intention, but, but let's just acknowledge change is hard. <laughs> it just is. And so... So talk to me about it. It's okay. Um, I think that's the, let's see, those are the main announcements. Yeah. So, the old elevator is no longer has the power, so no one's trying to use it. Yeah, nobody wants to use the old elevator anyway because it was scary and we'd get stuck, right? So we are just making it official and decommissioning it so we don't have to pay the state of Iowa to inspect it every year, right? So it's going to be officially done. It is I mean, it, yeah. It yeah. If you ask me for a key to use it, I'm not going to give it to you. You say, go use that one. So, yeah. So that's happening too. Okay. Um, youth group on Wednesday night is at the, at the, at the, it's Seeds of Faith Lutheran Church, 630. I think that's, yeah. I, there's, um, Magical night, I'm just going to say this because we could be here all morning. Magical night, this building is going to be hopping, and the youth group are going to be doing a, a ecumenical soup supper at the Methodist Church, in, um, and all the proceeds, all the, all the, it's free will donation, all that's going to go to support Southeast Lynn because their requests for help are up 40%. And so that's something that we can do, and um, we can use your help with that, too. So, okay, there's a lot. There's a lot. We're getting towards that busy, busy time of year. So, I invite you. We just threw a lot at you. I invite you to take a moment and take a deep breath. Just think about how you're sitting. Think about how your body is. Talking about audiovisual just may have tensed you up. So are your ears surrounded by your shoulders at this moment? Do you have a lot of tension? Maybe work that out. Oh, and remember, as we do this, that our breath is a reminder of God's life in each of us. Our need for breath and our need for connection. God and one another. All right, and with that renewed awareness, let us continue our worship of God together.
right, would you all stand for the call to worship, if able? When we seek justice for the other, when we love kindness more than ever, we live as God asks us to live. When we walk humbly through life, when we offer mercy to those who hurt us, we are the blessing God hopes we will be. When we are willing to look foolish by following Jesus, when we choose weakness rather than power, we reflect the one who is in our midst. Now, friends, let's join together in singing hymn number 410, God is Calling Through the Whisper. people who have missed the mark in our attempts to live in God's way, let us pray. What can we bring to you, Lord God? Not gifts of rams, of olive oil, of firstborn, for you are not interested in transactions. What can we bring to worship you? We bring ourselves as we are, for you are interested in transformations. We rejoice with Micah that you have told us what is good and what can tr transform us into a living expression of praise and worship. Forgive, Forgive us as we as struggle, struggle to do what is right, right. As, as we have, have seen only weakness and mercy, and walked with pride in the status of achievements and success. Forgive us as we seek ways to buy you off, when we know that what we really seek is transformation. May we, May we know, know your forgiveness, that it, that it would inspire us to do what is right, loving mercy, and stepping forward in faith, humbly with our God. Amen. Hear this good news. In Christ, God comes near to us, bringing hope, joy, and forgiveness into our lives. God gathers us the fragments of our lives and shapes us into new people. For this reason, we lift our thanks to God. Amen. Let's sing the response, number 750, Goodness is Stronger Than Evil.
May mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
In the beginning was the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we are on week 10 of the narrative lectionary, and we are beginning the first of a, of a, a few weeks with the prophets. We've done the law, the history uh, books, and um, now we're doing the prophets, the major and the minor prophets. Um, and they're called that because of how long their manuscripts are, not because one is more important than the other. Um, so the prophets were called by God to speak out to the leaders of Israel and of Judah to warn them that they were not being faithful to God and there would be consequences for these actions. So Micah, today we are with the prophet Micah, and Micah was a shepherd who lived in a village that was outside of Bethlehem, which was a village that was several miles, but within walking distance of Jerusalem. It, so the point is that Micah and his village and Bethlehem were all far from the halls of power in Jerusalem. It would be something like downstate Illinois and Chicago, right? There's a very different um, sense of, of uh, perspective from those two. Uh, he was active as a prophet in the late 8th century BCE when the northern kingdom of Israel fell, uh, was taken over by the Assyrian Empire. And um, it's also perhaps worth noting that not surprisingly, there were refugees from uh, the northern kingdom. Samaria was the city there. And they came down to Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem got a lot bigger quickly. Um, and uh, that, when things grow fast, right, that has its own things, its own problems. And also there, were, there was this big superpower, the Assyrian Empire, that was continuing to make the entire region, everything around it, unstable. So, and the, the kings of of Judah, the southern king, kingdom, um, were trying to figure out how to keep themselves safe, and they were not faithful to the covenant with God. So Micah condemned the corruption of Jerusalem and its leaders, and especially focused on the religious practices um, that, uh, that uh, was, they, they really had separated religious practice from ethical living. They focused on just doing the lip service and the going through the motions, So, as we'll hear today. So now listen for God's word to you in Micah as we read through uh, some verses of chapter 5 and of chapter 6. And I'll just mention that Solomon's wisdom was like three weeks ago, and I apparently have not taken that off of the bulletin yet, but it will be gone next week because I finally noticed it. <laughs> so, but you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be, one, be the one of peace. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.
What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? Justice, kindness, walk humbly with your God. To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. I didn't know if y'all would start singing with me or not. Thought you might, but you didn't. That's okay. It's okay. I didn't tell you to. Um, just it was, it was that was my little sociological experiment. Um, but you know that song, right? That song is familiar to you. Um, several years ago, we had a men's group come and perform, like they did close harmony stuff, and and um, part of the you know part of the liturgy was we still did the offering and we sang that song. And I remember talking to them afterwards, and they were like, "Wow, y'all sound really good when you sing that song." And several of us who were talking with them that said, "Yeah, that's just like." I mean, I've heard several people at different times say that song is kind of who we are as a congregation. Um, so we love this. We love this verse, right? It's, it's, um, so I think it's, I, I always get excited when this comes up in the lectionary. It doesn't happen very often. It does, obviously, in the narrative lectionary. But I think it's important for us to um, look at this. Look at, the, look, at the, look at what is the context of this, um, of this beloved uh, verse. Micah 6, 8. So um, just a little background information, and then we'll dive into it deeper. So chapter 6, if you, if you go and you look at Micah, and if you do, I recommend that you find your index, because those minor prophets are short, and it is hard to find them. <laughs> it's hard for me to find them, and <laughs> I'm a professional, so just, just so you know. Um, it starts off, chapter 6 is set up as a trial with God making a case uh, as if God is in a courtroom. At verse 6, 3, God says, O oh my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. And then God goes on to remind the people about all that God has done for them, you know, getting them, taking them out of Egypt, promised land, that. And then our reading this morning picked up with the people's response, asking what God wants from them. Um, the answer goes from the expected to the absurd. Burnt offerings, a year old calf, yeah, that was, that was pretty normal. Um, that was expected. Thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an exaggeration of what, what requirements would have been. Um, Giving the firstborn for my transgressions. What is he talking about there? Is that like a spiritual dedication? I'm afraid, my friends, the answer is no. Um, it is unfortunately true that the, the giving of the first, the sacrificing of the, of the firstborn was something that was happening in the, in, the, in the other religions of the groups that lived in the area. In fact, King Ahaz, who was one of the kings who reigned while Micah was, um, was writing. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 3, it tells us that he made his son pass through fire, which is a euphemism for he sacrificed his son. Ugh, yuck, gross, awful. God does not ask for nor condone this practice, and just as an aside, even with that very discomforting story of Abraham and Isaac with his son Isaac, a big part of the story, point of that story is that God does not ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. And it's a way of condemning that practice. Okay. But back to chapter 6. The crux of the matter is God is not interested in performative religious rituals. God isn't so much interested, concerned about the practice of religion, you know, the dotting of the I's, the crossing of the T's, but, 
but that those practices shape the people, shape their, their hearts and their minds, their lives, how they behave, what they do, how they treat others, right? And, and that is still true today. Um, the prophet Micah summarizes what God wants from us in this way. As you know, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. So let's talk about each of those. We start with justice. One of God's favorite, or, or well, I don't know if it's one of God's favorite words, but it's one of the Bible's favorite words. I should probably be clear about that. Um, one of the things that's interesting to note is that Micah says, do justice, right? Don't just love justice, do justice. Don't simply admire or appreciate justice or say, those people over there should be more just, right? It's we we are to actively pursue the making of a just society and to practice justice in our interpersonal relationships. I was really struck by that as a parent. Am I being just as a parent, right? You know, just all of these things. Am I being just with the, with the people in my life? In any instance in which we have influence, we ought to act with justice. So, as always happens, what I'm thinking about for the week is often in conversation with, with other things I'm doing, and um, I am reading this book, which I love, called This Here Flesh by Cole Arthur Riley. Um, the subtitle is Spirituality, Liberation, and the Stories That Make Us. It is gorgeous. Um, it's a collection of essays that offer a deep reflection on story, on her stories, on, on her family stories. Um, she has a chapter on justice, and she begins that chapter by relaying this story about her dad. So Cole Arthur Riley is black, and um, her dad, she and he were having a conversation about what it was like for him growing up in the inner city of Pittsburgh. And uh, when crack cocaine arrived, it changed everything. And this is, um, I'm going to read a con part of a conversation that they had. So it begins with her dad talking. A lot of people don't know what crack did. Maybe you're broke, but you can always buy a $5 rock, one of those little pieces of soap. Once you tried it, you didn't stop. And you weren't better than the next person. You could go out and make more money in an afternoon than your parents made in a month. Think about that, he says. She says, thanks, I hadn't. No, really, think about that, her dad continues. If you see your mom working eight hours during the day and another job at night and still coming home and saying, we gotta have peanut butter sandwiches for dinner, but you, a kid, no, you can go out and bring home steak. What are you going to do? Really, think about that. What are you going to do? I pause for a moment, then say, I'm selling. And he winces and smiles, dipping his head like he's paying his respects. She goes on to reflect. We cannot trust a society that makes judgments on the morality of a person without taking responsibility for how its own morality has instigated the condition that conditions that call for such desperate decision making. Ugh. And justice doesn't choose whose dignity is superior. It upholds the dignity of all those involved, no matter whom it offends or what it costs. Even when demanding retribution, justice does not demean the offender's dignity. It affirms it. It communicates that what has been done is not what the offender was made for. They, too, were made for beauty. In justice, everyone becomes more human. Everyone bears the image of the divine. Let's hear that again. 
injustice, everyone becomes more human. Everyone bears the image of the divine. Go buy this book and get it and read it. It is so good. I should have just read the whole book to you this morning, but that would have taken a long time. But anyway, this is how it is to be. This is how it's supposed to be. Right? That justice is about human dignity and the image of the divine in each one of us. It's how it should be. It's not how it is. And so we continue doing the work to tune our hearts and minds and lives to be for justice. So, love kindness. The Hebrew word is hesed. It's a great word to say, which is used very often in the Hebrew scriptures. It is translated as mercy. See, it is translated as mercy on my shirt. I believe that is much a decision about spacing. I think mercy fits better than kindness, and that's why it's mercy. But it's also one of the translations. It's also loving kindness, or as Eugene Peterson translates it, be compassionate and loyal in your love. It is about thinking what another person needs. Right? It really, it is thinking, it is about thinking like, like God thinks and trying to see how God sees. Hesed is about deep relationality, lasting and meaningful relationship. Kindness, you <clears throat> may be aware, has been making a comeback the last few years. Make America kind again, right? Those kind of things. Um, as a response to rhetoric, vitriol, division in our country. It's, 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 uh, and the unkindness, right? And this emphasis on kindness is a good thing, not allowing um, what is happening around us to make us put up defenses, we have a hard shell to be cruel in response, right? But to remain soft-hearted, and compassionate. It's just, it's just a stance and it's an important one. So love, love kindness. Seek to be kind, not just nice, right? Kindness is deeper. Kindness is more holistic. So that's what we're, that's what we're going for. And then walk humbly. Um, last but not least, Micah commends that we walk humbly with God. Now the word we translate as humbly, appears only here, so there's some question as to what it really and truly means, but um, what is clear is that there is a focus on God. And I love the word humble and humility um, because the root of that word is humus, not hummus. Hummus is also good, but humus, which um, is soil, ground, you know, most basic element when you let your leaves break down and the compost pile break down, that's, that's humus, right? That's an important and critical part of the soil. Um, so think about that humus, the, the earth, the ground. Uh, it supports us, literally. It feeds us. It sustains us, right? It's uh, all of us. I see humility, this, this, this um, call to be humble, as a leveling of our created hierarchies. Gosh, we love our hierarchies, don't we? We love pecking orders so much, so we keep creating them. But walking humbly insists that we are all in this together, that we need each other. We are individuals, yes, but absolutely we are part of a whole, something larger than ourselves, larger than individuals or family units or communities or however we want to divide up human beings, right? So it's walking humbly just kind of brings us all down together. Doing justice, loving kindness, being humble, these are not separate actions, really. They are, each of them informs and supports the others. True justice requires loving kindness. Loving kindness requires humility. Humility that takes God seriously requires justice, right? It's all... 
Celtic knot, maybe. If I am loving God and my neighbor, and loving my neighbor, as Jesus said, is the greatest commandment, an essential part of that is wanting justice and fairness for them. It is an ethic. It is a posture. It is a way of seeing and interpreting the world. And it is the work of a lifetime, right? Of a community's lifetime. None of us checks this list off so that we can move on to something else that God requires of us. <laughs> no one is ever done with justice. No one is ever done with kindness or done with humility, right? Did you know that there was an election this week? Did any, was anybody aware of that? Yeah, there was. Um, and based on the sampling of people that I ran into, um, many were left disappointed and discouraged. Um, several of my friends posted this, this meme on social media of a mother and a daughter. There's, there's a drawing of a mother and a daughter, and I think this is so good, and I think this really does sort of sum up where we are. The daughter asks her mother, but what if they lose? The mom responds, then we keep fighting for the rights of all people. And if they win, oh dear girl, it's the same answer, right? I'm not going to say the election didn't matter, but in a, there's a sense in which it didn't because it doesn't change who we are, and it doesn't change what our lives are about, and it doesn't change how we are called to live and care for others. Friends, I am grateful to be part of this community with you and our shared commitment to live as God calls us to live. Doing justice, living with kindness and compassion, and always in humility, aware of our shared humanity, and seeking to do all of this with God's help. Amen. And... Now we're going to sing about it to seal it all in. Well, I enjoy, invite you in joining um, hymn number 346 for the healing of the nations. together our joys and concerns and I just have a few here 
Um, Ann Cannon and James Cannon and Ann's sister Michelle are currently in Germany getting her mom's house there ready to sell. Her mom, you may recall, is settled into um, uh, settled, settled into a, 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 the right place for her in Pennsylvania, um, and that's all going well, but they still have a house in Germany, so um, they're doing that this week. If you can imagine trying to do that in a foreign company, with foreign, foreign land with a arrival time and a departure time. <laughs> Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. May it all go well. Um, I saw Al and Becky Aarons this week, and um, yeah, I'll just, I, Al is still there? The, the smile, the, the bright eyes, but yeah, the decline is steady. And I, um, I, I just happened to be there when um, his caregivers came in several times. And I just, I also want to um, offer thanks for them and just the acknowledgement of, my gracious, they were, they're so loving and good to him and Becky both. And um, how many people have such critically important jobs as that and are paid a pittance? They're not paid what they're worth. And there is a lack of justice in that, too. But um, thank God for them. And so just that whole situation, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We're delighted that Beth Simon is here. After, after a broken, broken shoulder and shoulder replacement, and go get him. Go, go, Beth. Keep healing. Keep, keep recovering. Um, do we have other, other joys and concerns we want to share this morning? This is a both and um, your prayers, but also it's kind of it's a celebration. My daughter is taking part four of her board exams um, right now in Minnesota. So, um, yeah. On a Sunday morning. Uh huh. Yeah, I know. I said a Sunday. She oh. said, "Yeah, they actually do it on a weekend first, for because okay. a lot of them are in internships, like." She is down here, so anyway, so she called me at 6.30 this morning. I didn't wake you up, did I, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> no, sweetheart. I had been up at 5 feeding the dog, but I had gone back to sleep. But anyway, so anyway, prayers yeah. for her. She's yeah. sitting for that right now. And I rarely do this, but I am going to ask a prayer for myself. I have the last few years, that some may or may not know, a very physical job and I am dealing with a shoulder injury that is not going away, and um, it's kind of hard to do that job with that, and uh, it's making it hard to sleep at night, too, so. Um, it also makes it hard to do that job. Yeah, so I'd appreciate your prayers that Absolutely. I can get that figured out. Yeah, Lord, in your Thank mercy, you. hear our prayer. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a joy um, I will be starting a naturalist educator internship job in January in Ohio, um, and um, so I won't really be here then, but I'll be doing work that helps people in nature, and so I am excited for that and hope that I can use it to get to a point where I can help make a more just way of people and the land to live together, so. Godspeed. We will miss you, but they're lucky to have you, and uh, yeah, yeah, and, we'll st and you're not leaving yet, so, yeah, thanks be to God for that opportunity, and uh, uh, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Yeah. Hey, I'm just going to jump in. So I, I know you have all probably seen this in the news, but there are so many children sick with RSV. And the hospitals are having to turn, I mean, fly babies all over. And so just prayers for these little ones and prayers for their parents and prayers for all of the medical staff who are um, heartbroken and working really hard trying to help all these kiddos. Um, 
next year there's supposed to be a vaccine for RSV, which is really hopeful, but this year getting through is hard, and so support and prayers for all those folks who are dealing with this right now. Absolutely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. else I just have one thing to say about the sermon that really helps me put this into perspective it's the word convict so we think of justice we all need to be convicted so we can carry our convictions but we need to know why we have those convictions and the why is where we get so messed up so often and that's where the humbly comes from so for me when I think of this verse specifically it's convict convictions and why so, just a little. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, we should have a sermon talk back sometime. The rest of you can add to it. I like it. I like it. All right. Um, as we often say, there are, there's, there's more going on than what we've said out loud here for, for everybody. Um, so, let us acknowledge that. Let's, um, and let me remind you that... Um, God longs to walk with us through whatever life slaps on our plate. And um, when God does that, God does not say, here is the path. Here's a nice map. Just follow this, and you will get exactly where you want to go. God just gives us enough light to see by, to see the next right step. And, um, but God is with us, right? God is with us in that. And so, as a, as a way of Affirming our trust in that truth, let us say together the Lord's, the prayer that Christ taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we belong to God. Everything we have, even life itself, is a gift from God. In gratitude to God, we return a portion of these gifts in our daily living and giving. No, I don't know what you're Yeah, it's coming. Uh, this is your choir audition team. So we can't do this sermon and this verse and not collectively sing. Uh, and to that end, uh, two things. One, I love playing the piano for church. I do. No secret, act surprised. Uh, but there are some times that I think instruments can get in the way of the words, and particularly the words of what I consider to be almost like our thesis. Second, um, since before COVID times, I always wanted to sing this doxology unaccompanied. And I never had the courage to drop out because I thought, what if it falls apart? What if they, this is a fireable offense? What will they do? <laughs> uh, and I never did. And so you can imagine in March of 2021, uh, 2020, when y'all all left, one of the most profound moments was when we played this. And I went, oh my gosh, where are the people? Ah, so guys, you're going to make my dream come true today. This is me, 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 right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask our wonderful choir to come up and, and help lead us, and we are going to sing this doxology um, unaccompanied and bravely. If you need, uh, if you need courage, the, uh, the, the back row people usually will be singing the, what does the Lord? Uh, the altos will be singing, justice, kindness. And then as the spirit leads... Our, our higher voices can sing to the, yeah, yeah, you know. I'll sing that part. Thank you. Yeah, I'm counting our, on you. Our, and we're, uh, we're going through it like we usually do. We're just like, usually just like, just without. Start, See, my, the sermon start was just, it was just a preview. It was just a preview. And you thought it was. Here's your intro.
pray together? Yeah, and you're supposed, you can sit or stand, whatever. We're going to stand up in a second. Let's pray together. Giver of every good gift, your generosity to us is without limit. We thank you that you have blessed us, and we acknowledge that you intend for us to share our blessings with others and with our world. Take what we offer each day, make more of it, do more with it than we can ask or imagine. Expand our hearts to offer ourselves as generously as you do. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. And our final hymn is hymn number 749, Come Live in the Light. But after that, we're doing November birthday blessings. So if you have a November birthday, please come down because the list I have, none of them are here. Tender here. Um, we usually sit over there. I am a member of First Presbyterian Church in Marion, which is why we're occasional. But it, now a new resident of Mount Vernon. Yes, so. I do live in Mount Vernon. Yeah. My birth date is November 6th, and a friend reminded me last Sunday that I actually had 25 hours to celebrate. My <laughs> that I guess is never going to happen in the future, so I should have enjoyed it. <laughs> But I think I fell asleep an hour early. <laughs> and my natal year is 1949, and you can figure out how old I am. Oh, we love math problems here, don't we? I'm Connie Prophet. Uh, 
November 5th, which was beginning of the last week, I turned 90. So. Are you? No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Oh my gosh, Connie. Wow. Um, Beth McCollum, yes, Beth McCollum's birthday, November 16th. Yay, Beth, we're so glad. And um, Carl Riekers shares Connie's birthday. birthday. Uh, Sam Bray, Rita Swales, Jonathan Lenhart, Ann Cannon, uh, Terry Kaplan, Cooper Bechtold, um, Beth McCollum, Amy Weber, Mildred Grubbs. Yeah, okay, she makes- She's older than I am. She makes Connie look like a teenager. She's over 100, isn't she? Um, Carol Dillard. Lynn Betcher and Ewan Betcher. So, um, Roger, Connie, Beth, all you November birthday people, it is my uh, privilege and joy on behalf of the congregation to tell you that we are so glad that you were born. We are so grateful for the, God, the person that God created you to be, for the gifts and talents and abilities that you have and the way that you uh, share them in your lives, with your families, with your with your communities, with workplaces, with churches, with all of it, just that, and that the world is a better place because you, you, you are in it. So we thank God for you, and we're going to sing about it for our dear friends. Benedict, that um, we can stay here and talk about things with an audiovisual, or we can grab a table downstairs or two and have. So, so we'll just we'll meet up here, and if we move downstairs and eat and drink while we converse, that's good too. Um, whether you have a November birthday or not, friends, go out into the world in peace to. Tune your hearts and minds and lives to, to justice, to living with kindness, and to being humble and remembering that we are all in this together. And as we seek to do that, remember that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit are at work in you, in the people near and far from you, and in the world out there ahead of us this day and forever 